Okay, today we are picking up in our study in Acts chapter 6. Now, when we were in Acts chapter 5, uh, we started off in Acts chapter 5 with a conflict within the church. And by the time we finished Acts chapter 5, we were dealing with persecution without. And we're going to see that here uh, in Acts chapter 6. We're going to start off with a, a conflict that starts off within the church. And by the time we finish the chapter, we're going to see some persecution without. And so we're going to see this, this pattern uh, repeated here again. And, uh, and I used a term last week that I'm going to correct. I, I used the term ethnic discrimination. I want to correct that when we get into it, uh, this chapter. Because what we're going to see is not so much an ethnic discrimination as much as we're going to see a cultural uh, discrimination. And I'll, I'll explain a, a little more carefully what I, what I mean by that. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into it. And we will be looking at some other passages of Scripture as we move through this. So please have your Bibles ready. Uh, but getting into Acts chapter 6, verse 1, I'm going off the notes here. Uh, Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, tells us, he says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, this complaint that arose on the part of the Hellenistic uh, Jews, um, these Hellenistic Jews would have been Greek-speaking Jews who would have been born and enculturated outside of Israel. If you know your Old Testament history, uh, you know that in 586 B.C., uh, Nebuchadnezzar... Uh, after laying siege on Jerusalem, he eventually destroyed the city of Jerusalem. He broke down its wall. He burned the city to the ground. Jeremiah describes this. Uh, uh, and uh, the book of Lamentations itself describes much of this uh, from the prophet's viewpoint. That Lamentations is, after all, a lament. And he describes what goes on. Uh, when, he, when he sees his people being taken away into captivity. But what that begins is it begins the time period prophetically known as the times of the Gentiles, in which Israel did not have a king upon the throne. Uh, and they were under Gentile rule, as it were, prophetically speaking. And uh, it also began this time period known as the dispersion, or the diaspora, and these Jews were, were scattered. They were scattered throughout the world. They were sent into different parts of the world. And so as they were scattered and living in different parts of the world, they then began to adopt the language and the culture of the, of the regions to which they were scattered. And this happens. You know, you, you move to a different country, you wind up adopting the language and the culture of that country. It just it happens over time. Uh, I was the pastor of an of a, uh, English speaking ministry in a Chinese church for about 25 months, and you could see the cultural differences there. Uh, Karen was there, her husband was the youth minister there for a number of years, and you could see the grandparents, the parents, and the children, and the cultural differences that existed uh, uh, from those who came over from mainland China, from those who were born here in the U.S., and the language differences and the cultural differences, and there was conflict that arose in the church uh, as a result. And and what we're seeing is some of the cultural differences that existed here within the church, within the early church. Now, these Hellenistic Jews would have been Jews that had basically been living outside of Israel. They would have spoken Greek. Um, they would have been reading a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Around 250 B.C., uh, there was a translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. It was called the Septuagint. The Septuagint, it was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. I have a copy up here for anybody that would like to come see it afterwards. It's called the Septuagint, and what it is is it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Now, the native Hebrews, these would have been Jews that would have been born in, in Israel. Uh, they would have spoken Aramaic. Many of them would have been reading the Hebrew Old Testament. That's what this is right here. This is called the Biblia Hebraica Stugartensia. It is the Hebrew Old Testament. I have a copy up here for any of you that would like to come and look at it afterwards as well. And this is the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, 
Uh, and so there would have been a difference even in the Old Testament translations or, or books that they would have been reading, either a translation or the Hebrew text itself. Uh, this is also referred to as the Tanakh, the Tanakh, which is a, uh, another term that refers to the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketubim, or the Law and the Prophets and the Writings, as that term uh, means. But there would have been cultural differences. They would have dressed differently having come from different regions of the world, because when people come from different regions of the world, they dress differently, don't they? They wear different types of clothing. Uh, they speak different languages. Uh, they eat different kinds of food, don't they? Um, and, and sometimes people can feel different around people that come from different cultures, don't they? They, they? they sometimes don't feel a connection or a bond. And so what we have here is we have people that are coming together in the church, but we have this cultural uh, problem that arises. And so what happens here is that uh, there was this complaint that arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews, that is these Greek-speaking Jews, again, who were born and acculturated outside of Israel. And the, and the complaint arose against the native Hebrews, that is the Aramaic-speaking Jews who had been born and were acculturated in, in Israel, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And so what we have here is a form of cultural discrimination, is what we have. Now verse 2 it says, So the twelve, and this would be the twelve apostles, summoned the congregation of the disciples. And they said to them, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now the verb that appears here is the Greek verb diakoneo. Diakoneo. And, uh, and, and the verb simply means to serve. Uh, it's the word that we bring into the English for, for deacon. Uh, and it simply means to serve. And, um, and so they, they make the comment here. They say, so, so the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now, they were honest in their address. I mean, they addressed the problem. They saw it's a problem. And by the way, let, let me make a comment here real quick, and I'll address it in a, little, a little more detail later on. But this goes to show that regeneration among believers does not remove uh, the prejudices of the world. That, 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 that when you have people that are born again, regeneration does not automatically remove worldly prejudices. Because at the moment of salvation, when a person believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, when, when, it, when it comes to, to really understanding anything more than that, well, what does that person know about Christianity? Really, nothing. And, and really, to get into living the Christian life, you have to really get into the Word of God. It really takes uh, a, a time of investment, of study, and learning the Word of God to push out a lifetime of worldly and human viewpoint so that you can begin to orient to understand what the Word of God is so that you can then begin to live the will of God. But what you have here is a conflict that exists that, that basically comes from this human viewpoint thinking uh, from their pre-salvation life. Because you have this, this discrimination that's existing uh, in the church. And so it says in verse 2 that so the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said to them, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. And verse 3 it says, therefore the brethren, therefore brethren, and, and catch this, he says, select from among you, that is from the ranks of the church body, seven men, that is from amongst themselves, they were to judge by that these seven men were to be judged by the members of the church, uh, to be men of good reputation, full of the Spirit. That is, they were to be led by the Spirit um, and of wisdom. And the word wisdom here is the Greek word Sophia. And this has the idea of men who were governed by biblical truth that is practically applied to life. Biblical truth that is practically applied to life. And I say that in both ways there because one can have a knowledge of God's truth and not apply it. One can have a knowledge of God's truth and not apply it. I've, I, over the years, I, it, it has amazed me 
that I, that I can talk to people who are studied in the Word of God. And yet when it comes to living that truth, they don't. Now there's a number of reasons why people don't. I mean, it could be that they're uh, pursuing the flesh. It could be that they're that, that they're just emoting. It, it could be that they're that they're in a, the midst of a crisis and they're mentally they're just shutting down. I mean, there's a number of reasons why people don't apply the truth that they know. But but simply knowing God's word is no guarantee that you're going to apply it. I love the passage in in Matthew seven, uh, I think it's verse twenty four, where Jesus said, "The man who hears my words." and does them shall be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And so wisdom there is hearing and doing, right? It's not just the hearing. He says, the man who hears my words and does them shall be compared to a wise man. But then he says, but the man who hears my words and does not do them shall be what? Shall be like a fool. And so you can hear and not do. And so I think when, 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 the, disciples, when the apostles here are, are saying, therefore select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit, that is men who are led by the Spirit and not by the flesh, and of wisdom, that is men whose life it has, is outwardly observed as, as having biblical truth that is practically applied to life, whom we may put in charge of the task, of this task, and so what you have here is you have a collaboration between the members of the church and the apostles. Now to me, this is of great practical importance. Because the responsibility does not fall solely upon the leadership. Do you know what you have here? You have delegation. You have the leadership of the, of, of the church here, the apostles. Basically, when the problem is brought to them, what do they do? They put it back, don't they? They say, look, you select from among yourselves men that are full of the Spirit, that have wisdom, and bring them to us, okay? And then we will put them in charge of the task. But there is a collaboration between the church and the leadership. And I think that, that this, by way of, of practice is significant. And by the way, one of the things that I pointed out before is that when you're going through the book of Acts, what you have here as a historical book is descriptive, not prescriptive. Remember, we've talked about that. What you have is descriptive, not prescriptive. What you have is Luke telling us what they did. He's not necessarily telling us what we should do. In other words, this is not a mandate saying the church has to do it this way. This is not an imperative saying the church has to set up a model to do it this way. This is simply telling us what they did. And it becomes a model that, that, as, that as, as a church uh, we can look at this and we can say, well, this is what they did. And this, by the way, also shows that they were flexible. It shows that as problems arose, there was a certain flexibility in the church, that there was an adaptability there, that they were willing to adapt to their situations. A lot of churches don't have that. A lot of churches fail to uh, have that adaptability to situations. Verse 4, and here they set their priority. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now that's the priority. That is the priority. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You see, they realized their roles and their responsibility. They realized their roles within the church and what their responsibilities were. Okay? By the way, I think it's interesting too here that even when they recognized the problem, they really didn't assign blame. They, they didn't get into any, any blaming or name calling or any of that sort of thing. They offered an immediate solution. And I think that there's a great deal of practical wisdom there as well. They didn't get in, into any blaming or name-calling. They recognized the problem, but they immediately sought a solution to it. And we're going to see the wisdom of that here in just a minute. Verse 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose, and we're going to have a list of seven names here. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, and by the way, Nicholas here 
uh, was a Gentile, and it tells us that, a proselyte from Antioch. Now, what's interesting about this list of names is they're all Greek names. They're all Greek names. Now, I thought about that. I thought about that for a minute. And I thought about what is the practical wisdom of this selection of these seven men. Now, here you have these widows who feel that a personal injustice has been done to them. Because in the daily serving of these meals, they feel that they have been neglected. Now, anger comes from a perceived injustice, real or imagined. Anger is the response to a perceived injustice, and they feel that, that an injustice has been done to them. And in this situation, there's an outcry. There's an outcry, a complaint that arises over this injustice that happens to them in the sense that, that uh, they feel that they have been neglected regarding the daily serving of the meals. And they feel that the injustice has been done to them by who? Who, who, who's, who, who do they feel is the guilty party? The native Hebrews, right? So in the selection of these seven, these seven are going to be responsible for what? what? What are they now going to do? They are now going to deliver the meals to these Hellenistic widows, these Greek-speaking widows, right? So what in effect we have here is the formation of the first Meals on Wheels. <laughs> and these seven men have been selected to make, sure, to make sure that the meals are delivered to these widows on a daily basis. Now, the fact that these seven men are selected from the ranks of the Hellenistic Jews, and the fact that they all have Greek-speaking names, do you think that that would make the Hellenistic widows feel more comfortable? The fact that somebody from their culture showed up? Do you, do you think so? I tend to think that there is some practical wisdom in the selection of these seven men that would have made these elderly widows feel comfortable in the men that were selected because of their cultural similarity, because of their names, because it would have made them feel comfortable on a very natural, practical level. And I think that there is some practical wisdom to be seen here in the selection of these men that I don't think should be overlooked from the text. Okay? Verse 6, and they brought before the apostles, and, and, and these they brought before the apostles, and after praying they laid hands on them, and the laying on of hands was a sign of identification a sign of identification and approval is what it would have been. Verse 7, And the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and many great, and many, uh, and, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. This is very interesting because these would have been priests that would have been serving in the temple. And now we get to a shift in this chapter. I'll be honest, when, 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 when we look at the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible, we have to realize that these were inserted by men. Um, who was the guy that did the chapter and verse divisions? Was it, was, it, uh, was it Robert Stevens? Was that his name? Was traveling on horseback from Paris to Lyon. He was doing it on horseback, I think. Anyway, uh, the guy that did the chapter and verse divisions, I don't know that I always agree with how they're divided. Um, because I think that I would have broken this here at verse 8 and made this a separate chapter because of the way that this is divided. I don't know that this is a, a nice, clean break in the chapter. You read through some of the chapters and you think, well, why is this in here? And why didn't they break it differently? And you, you wonder what was the rationale behind that. It just doesn't always make sense sometimes when you're reading through the text because you have a nice little section break here. But uh, be that as it is, in verse 8... 
we have one of three persons that, that from this section Luke is going to focus on uh, for three different panels here that we're going to look at uh, in, 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 the, in the book of Acts. So from this point on in Luke 6, 8, uh, there are three people that are going to become the focal point of Luke in the book of Acts. The first one that we're going to look at, the first panel, is going to be Stephen. Now, it says here in Luke, in Acts 6, 8, it simply says, and Stephen. Uh, and Stephen is going to be the subject uh, of Luke's discussion uh, from this point up until Acts 8. And then when you get to Acts 8, 5, uh, Luke is going to shift and he's going to start talking about Philip. And when you get to Acts 8, 5, uh, Philip is going to be the person of discussion. Uh, Luke is going to switch and he's going to start off with Philip. And then when you get over to Acts 9, 1, he's then going to switch persons and he's going to start dealing with Saul, whom we will later on know to be Paul. But Stephen here then becomes the point of, of, uh, of interest. Uh, and I love... Uh, Stephen, he is just, he's, man, he is just a very colorful individual. We are really going to take the time to develop his message. It's, wow. I mean, you want to talk about some doctrine really packed into this guy's brain. I mean, he's selected as, as this servant who's going to be serving meals to these widows. He delivers one of the most uh, stellar doctrinal messages that just goes through this panoramic, historical, theological, doctrinal overview of the Old Testament. And by the time he gets through delivering this message, I mean, you just want to stand up and just give this man a, a one-man way, I mean, just this ovation, you know, just applause. And yet, his, those, and he's standing alone in front of these, um, these men. By the time he gets through with his message, they are so outraged that they're putting their hands on their ears and they're shouting at him just to try to drown his voice out and they charge at him with such violence and they drag him uh, away and eventually stone him to death. I mean, they meet him with such violent force. And, uh, and does, he, does he reciprocate? And the answer is no. He, he shows such beautiful grace. He, he falls to his knees and he prays on their behalf. He is not overcome by the evil that is... That is upon him, uh, but he, he shows such kindness, he, he shows such grace, he calls out to the Lord, he prays on their behalf, he, he demonstrates such a humility and such a, a love that, that it's so far from us to understand sometimes in our day and culture. Um, I'm anticipating myself though. Um, but it starts off here with this introduction, it just simply says, and Stephen, a man full of grace and power. And I think that phrase tells us uh, just uh, something about who he was, that he was a man of such eloquence in his speech and such power in his language. And we're going to see that when we get into his message because, man, this guy, he really, he knew how to talk. I mean, he really had such a command of, of, the, of the biblical uh, 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 understanding. I mean, he really knew the scriptures. It says, And Stephen, a man f uh, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. And here we have verse 9, But some men from what was called the synagogue of freedmen, and they were called freedmen because they were men who were once Jewish slaves outside of Israel, and now they were free to worship in Israel. So, so they were these men who, who, who were at, gathered together at the synagogue. We know historically that there were probably a little over 400 synagogues the word synagogue comes from the Greek word synagoge, ago meaning to gather, soon together. And synagoge was simply a gathering together. And a synagogue was just a place where they gathered together uh, for, for, for teaching. Um, and so these men gathered together. They were called the freedmen because they were at one time slaves, perhaps under Roman provinces, we're going to see here. It says, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians. These would be people from the region of North Africa and from Cilicia, that is from the region we would today know as Syria, and Asia, the, the area we would know today as Turkey. And so these were these freedmen who, when they came to Israel, to Jerusalem, they were in this place, and they were called the synagogue of the freedmen. And they rose up and they argued with Stephen. So notice who's attacking who. They rose up and they 
argued with Stephen. So we know the direction of the argumentation that these people came and began to argue with Stephen. Verse 10, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And so here's Stephen by himself, by himself, handling the scriptures in such a way, handling the scriptures in such a way that the whole lot of them were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. I would love to sit in on some of these discussions. You know, we're not given the detail. We are in the next chapter. We see Stephen's presentation. But, but you would lo I'd love to hear this back and forth and to see how he handled himself. And the scripture says that they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And of course, when they could not argue him down, when they could not defeat him with their words, then they sought to defeat him through lies and through character assassination. Verse 11 says, Then, and this would be in their frustration and desperation, they secretly induced men, saying, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. You see what they do? They go out in public and they, they get into character assassination. They begin to publicly malign him, vilify him out in, out in public, talk about him. You see, they want to destroy his character. Verse 12, and they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came and dragged him. And the word dragged is soon harpazo, soon harpazo. And the word harpazo, by the way, uh, is the word that we see that's uh, used in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Harpazo is the word that is used of the Lord himself when he takes the church out of this world. It's a word that means to take or to seize. It's often used to mean to take against one's force or, or to take against one's will. Because at the time of the rapture, the Lord isn't going to ask anybody if you want to go. Okay? He's simply going to take you. <laughs> right? And uh, quite frankly, I say, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> you know, interrupt me at any time. <laughs> you know? Uh, let's go. The sooner the better. But soon our podzo uh, adds this element, the, 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 the prefix here uh, adds this idea of, of amplifies it. It's this idea of, of violence, to seize by force. And so they came up to him and they dragged him with this violence. They dragged him away and brought him before the council. And they put forth false witnesses. Man, these guys are ruthless. They are out to destroy him at any and all costs. They put forth false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. But we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Verse 15, And, and fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. And I could not help but think of Moses when he came down off the mountain. Remember when he had been in the presence of God that his face was shown. Remember he had to put a veil. Remember? And, uh, and we're just given this descriptive phrase about Stephen. And, uh, and so this begins to set up uh, this presentation that Stephen will then give uh, in, in Acts 7. And wow, <laughs> what, a, what a presentation. Now let me go into the summary here of, of Acts 6. The central idea of the text if we look at the chapter as a whole, is that a problem arose within the church that threatened the teaching and preaching ministry of the apostles. And the problem was resolved by the selection of seven spiritually mature men, one of whom became a public speaker and experienced conflict and persecution from outside the church. And so the problem was resolved through the selection of these men, but one of whom we see immediately becomes this public speaker. Uh, and all of a sudden he becomes the point of persecution. Let me go over on the back side here. The cultural conflict that occurred in Acts 6.1 shows that pre-salvation prejudices are not automatically removed at the moment of regeneration and was the basis for problems within the church. To the degree the believer continues to think and behave like the world, he'll be the source of conflict within the church. To the degree, I'll state that again, to the degree the believer continues to think and behave like the world, he'll be the source of conflict within the church. It is imperative that the believer grow up as a Christian ASAP. <laughs> because the sooner we grow up and learn the Word of God and can walk in the will of God and understand the spiritual life and to learn to love and walk in grace and humility, 
I'll tell you, the church becomes such a beautiful place. Such a beautiful place. And living and fellowshipping with love and grace-oriented believers, I'll tell you, it is just the most wonderful thing. Give me grace-oriented believers any day of the week. I've been in legalistic churches, I'll tell you, no thank you. I, I run. I can't get out fast enough. Point number three. The conflict that arose in Acts 6.1 threatened to pull the apostles away from their ministry of teaching and preaching God's word. The problem needed to be addressed. Let's be clear. The problem needed to be addressed. But the greater responsibility of teaching and preaching God's word necessitated that it be handled by someone other than the apostles whose primary duty lay in communicating the scriptures. That's where their primary duty lay, was in communicating the scripture. The apostles were wise and asked the church to evaluate and select men they thought worthy to resolve the conflict. And it appears that from this conflict arose the office of deacon. Look, let me be clear. The word deacon does not appear uh, in this... They were never called deacons. And I'll be clear about that. When you're looking at Acts 6, they were never clearly identified as being called deacons. Okay? Now, many would say that you have... The verb form here, uh, you would, they would say, well, you know, this is the origin. You know, some would say yes, some would say no. I won't be dogmatic on it, but it appears that from this conflict you have the office of deacon originating. Once chosen, the seven men were brought before the apostles who laid their hands on them as a sign of approval. Luke then records that from this chosen group, Stephen and Philip shared in the spreading of God's word. Now, what we're going to see is the persecution that happens with Stephen scatters the church. It scatters the church. And what it also does is it scatters the gospel. The gospel gets sent out as a result. And the seeds of God's word then spread. And people all over the world get saved. I mean, even our salvation here is a result of the scattering that occurred then and there. Because it was spread out. Point number four, it's clear that the early church sought to meet the needs of Christians both spiritually and physically. When the church gave priority to things spiritual, it fulfilled its obligations to things physical. And I think that's a truth that is often neglected. I'll state that again. When the church gave priority to things spiritual, and I'm talking about things related to the teaching of the Word of God, it fulfilled its obligation to things physical. Point number five, Acts 6, 1 through 6 describes, not prescribes, how the leadership worked with the church to resolve a conflict. Another example would be found in Acts 15.22, that is after the resolution of a doctrinal conflict, where there was a collaboration between the leadership and the whole church to select men to travel with Paul and Barnabas. It's interesting in that context that there was a doctrinal conflict that arose and the leadership resolved it, but even afterwards it, you have this phrase that they worked with the whole church to select certain men to deliver uh, this letter to these churches. And so the fact that the whole church was brought in, I don't think can, should, should be missed. Uh, too often, it's often left just to the leadership alone, and often the church is excluded as a body on certain matters, and I don't know that that's completely biblical. Um, point number six, the seven men chosen in Acts 6, 5 all had Greek names, and this may reflect practical wisdom on the part of the church. Since the first duty of these men was to make sure the Hellenistic widows received their daily meals and familiar sounding names probably would have, had, would have comforted the widows who had, who had been unjustly neglected. And I think that there's a great practical wisdom there. Point number seven. The first introduction we have of Stephen is that he is a man of great grace, power, and wisdom. Because Stephen was so proficient in his presentation of God's word, showing from scripture that Jesus is the Christ, he threatened the theological base of those who opposed him. The freedmen were diaspora Jews who were at one time living outside of Israel as slaves, but had been set free and were now living in Israel. Their common bond was their freedom from, from physical slavery, yet they were hostile to Stephen who offered them spiritual freedom in Christ. 
And that's intriguing to me. They were known as the synagogue of the freedmen. They were physically free. Spiritually, they were slaves. And Stephen comes to them with Jesus Christ and offers them spiritual life and spiritual freedom. And they reject him. And as we're going to see in the final analysis, they stone him to death. When the freedmen could not silence Stephen by argumentation, they resorted to public slander and eventual murder by stoning him in order to quiet him. Stephen takes up such a large section in Acts because he is the first Christian martyr and his death is the basis for the great church persecution that scattered the church all over the world. I'll tell you, I read about Stephen and my heart pounds. I get so passionate about who he is and what, what he represents in Acts because he is such a turning point in the church. It just, ah, it just so stirs me. Point number eight. Many churches today want their pastor to be a good Bible teacher. Unfortunately, many don't. <laughs> I probably should have phrased that a little differently. Um, you know, many churches are out to be the first church at Disneyland, unfortunately. Um, you know, but, but seriously, and, and I'm not opposed to a, to, to a good church, but, you know, the, the, the church first and foremost ought to be a base for good, solid teaching. I mean, really, that's really what it ought to be first and foremost. Um, the churches today want their pastor to be a good Bible teacher, but also want him to be a CEO, a marketing director, an activities manager, and so on. A good pastor is to devote himself primarily to prayer and to the study and teaching of God's Word so he can fulfill his duties of, of feeding God's people. The reality is that the pastor must rely on the faithful service of others in the church to share and shoulder the regular responsibilities. Otherwise, the church cannot, otherwise the church will be reduced from a spiritual organism to one merely of programs and moral activities. And I've seen that too many times. Too many times. Um, and we, of course, we don't want that here. We don't have that here. I thank God for that. Uh, you know, the people that, that serve here and everybody who does their share, I'll tell you, it, it, it makes this fellowship a blessing. And I, I hope that we can continue to grow and, be, uh, and have, have the service that we have. You know, so...